I bet it was a blast in The Last Illusion taking real life characters like Harry Houdini and Pablo Picasso and bringing them to life on the page with Molly. Uh, yeah, that was, I read, of course, all the books on Harry Houdini. And um, so that was really fun to have Molly involved with him and to use some of his real um, escape tricks that he did. Um, so yeah, I, that, that was a fun book. I, I, he, well, each one of the books, I have gone into another area. And, and so there's been new research for me um, and a, a, a new sort of environment in, uh, in Gilded Cage that you mentioned. It's to do with um, chemistry at the time. And uh, what, what sparked that was someone sent me a book called Lee's Famous Recipes. And they weren't cooking recipes. They were recipes for face creams and uh, medicines, patent medicines for various. And you look down these and you think you would kill people with these. I mean, they had mercury in them, they had arsenic in them, they had all sorts of awful stuff in them. And you think, yeah, you would kill people very easily with these. And then you think, aha, this sounds good. And then you take it from there. How much fun did you have giving fans a whole new kind of detective against a completely different historical backdrop when you introduced Lady Georgie and her royal spinous? She came from me being stubborn, actually. My publisher at the time kept saying to me, we can't really break you out unless you write us a big dark standalone. So I started to think about uh, child molesters, serial killers, terrorists poisoning the water supply. And then I suddenly thought, wait, do I want to spend six months in this sort of darkness? And I thought, no, I don't. So I thought, what would be the most unlikely sleuth I could possibly come up with? How about if she was royal, but she was penniless? And it was that fascinating time in the 1930s when you're poised between two world wars, when some things have completely changed, but other things haven't. You know, in 1930, the 1930 census, the biggest category of employment was still domestic servant. So we have not moved away from Downton Abbey at that time. So um, when I started that, so I created a fictitious daughter of Queen Victoria for her, who was her, her um, grandmother. And um, so Queen Victoria was her great grandmother. Her father was a Royal Duke. Um, and he, when the, when the series opens, he's already dead. He's in the great crash of 29, he has gone up on the moors and shot himself with his grouse gun. But I, I add to that, although how he did that was always a mystery because he never was a very good shot. Um, uh, and he had married her mother, who was an actress, a very famous actress, but from a, a, a humble background. So Georgie is poised between two worlds. She has the royal side and she has a grandfather who lives, who is a, a retired London policeman who lives in a very humble little house. Um, and so I think because she's this poised between two backgrounds. She's a good observer. And so um, in the first book, she, like Molly, is struggling to survive in a difficult environment. She runs away from what seems to be her destiny, which is to be married off to some of one of those, as she puts it, chinless, spineless, and half imbecile princes that still seem to litter Europe. Uh, and she runs away from that and tries to make it on her own in London with no money. And of course, no training on how you make it on your own. So she tries various jobs, which all end disastrously. Um, and, um, you know, after a few books, she's sort of done a bit better, but she's found it's very hard to start with when you don't have a family backing and certainly no money, because this is the Great Depression. The books start, I think, in 1932. So it, we still have people standing in soup kitchens and bread lines and men with all their, their war medals saying, we'll accept any sort of work. So nobody's going to hire Georgie who knows how to walk around with a book on her head and where to seat a bishop at a dinner table. That's, that's pretty much you know, what she can do. So we, we've taken her from there and we've got up to 15 books in that now too. So she's yeah. still all right so far. Why did you feel it was so important to establish that relationship between Georgie and the royal family so early on in the first book and then a royal pain as it pertains to the rest of the 14 books in the series? I wanted to establish a good connection to the royal family because we're going to bring in uh, the Prince of Wales and Mrs. Simpson and all those gloriously delicious things that happen in the 1930s. Um, and coming up to one day the advocate, uh, death of King George and the abdication and what happens then and maybe leading up to World War II. So I wanted Georgie early on to establish a relationship. So I, uh, I brought her into uh, 
to do little things for the queen. The queen asks her to do very embarrassing things. If, as the series goes along, you know, she sends her to recover a snuff box that someone has pinched from Buckingham Palace. And, you know, so things like that. Um, and I wanted, when I've dealt with the royals, I've tried to keep absolutely as much as possible to something they would have said. Um, either it was direct quotes or at some opinion I knew they expressed because I didn't want to make them into fictitious characters really. I wanted to tie us to reality with that. Um, and um, there have been some great quotes along the way. There's one book in which she meets Princess Elizabeth and Margaret and they're little girls at this time and they're her cousins of course. So she says hello Elizabeth and she says hello Margaret and Margaret who is three and, and is already becoming a little bit of a, an uppity miss says, I'm, I, uh, I'm a princess, you have to call me Princess Margaret. So Georgie said, well, in that case, you have to call me Lady Georgie. So Margaret looks up at her, her nanny and she says, is a lady better than a princess? <laughs> and the nanny replies, we hope a princess will grow up to be a lady. And that was a true quote and it was just so good. I, so I've used some like that, which were fun to use in the series. You're such a master craftsman on a mystery set against real times in history. What do you do in the course of your research to really keep that authentic with readers from book to book? The one mistake that I can make as a writer in think is thinking that I know something. I did something terrible. In one of the books, I put Claridge's on the wrong street, which is unforgivable because my parents lived next door to the night manager at Claridge's. So they're probably, you know. Um, but the thing is, when you think you know something, and I also, in one of the books, had her walking up Constitution Hill from where she lives in Belgravia to the palace. Next time I was in London, I thought, ah, you walk down Constitution Hill. You know, so things like that. So since then, I've really double checked everything that, you know, I gave her a house that I liked on Belgrave Square. And then I've walked to her friend Belinda's Muse and everything. So yeah, I do walk it again. I have, you asked about the, the true feeling about it. I grew up, obviously the generation older than me was Georgie's age in the 1930s. And so I know how they spoke and I know what was important to them. And I know, you know, which film stars they liked and which plays they saw in London, because I heard all about that. And then I married a man who actually comes from an aristocratic family. So I have, um, I've experienced all this for myself. Uh, John's sister still lives in 14th century Merthyn Manor and the cousin owns the stately home called Trella Warren and his name is Sephera's Vivian. So you can't get much more aristocratic. And so I've sat when people sit together and they say things like, do you remember that joke we played on the butler that time? And so I get out my little notebook and I scribble it all down. So it's, it's all authentic. It was funny because, you know, um, you get reviews on Amazon and um, uh, I, one, of, one of the, not in the Georgie series, but in the, in the standalones in Farley Field takes place at a stately home with an, an earl. And one, the only one bad review I ever had said, this woman knows nothing about British or the British aristocracy. My husband was so upset, he was determined to find out who she was and hunt her down. And I said, you can't do that. Um, but no, so it is very authentic because a lot of it is things that I actually know. So, um, and then things I don't know, I go and check on. Um, when Georgie gets married, it's the church just around the corner from where we always stay in London. So a lot of things are part of my own life, my own past. She goes to stay in one of the books with the Duke of Ainsford. Well, Ainsford was the village next to where I lived growing up. And, um, it's a, a delightful little village still. So I put a stately home there and I created a duke. So they're all places really want to have a great feel for the place. I don't think you could really write well about a place that you don't know well. You can always tell, I write a book, I, I read a book that's been set in London. And I think, ah, oh, this person's never been to London. They've read books set in London. You can or tell. If, yeah, or if they have been to London, they've done like a three day tour and they never get the feel of what it's like to be on this street or that street. Um, and sometimes it's absolutely wrong and I go rubbish, you know. <laughs> so um, I think you, it's very hard. I've never written a book about a place I haven't been a couple of times. Uh, so, you know, that's, that I try and do that. You have to get that great feel. Uh, the, the latest book I've written, which is coming out next year is set in Venice. And I've been to Venice many, many times, but last summer I was there specifically for the research. 
so that everything I did, I'd stand on a corner and think, what smell do you smell here? Um, where's, where's that cafe? What do they serve? All those little things that bring a place to life. 